I'd say at least four minutes. Sometimes I'd have athletes once they get once they're a little bit fitter, maybe getting up to about six minutes. But uh, those longer duration uh, bouts would probably be the way to go. The Triathlon Show, two hundred and forty-three. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host, Michael, and on today's episode, I interview Michael Rosenblatt. Michael is a Canadian researcher and a lecturer, and one of his main research papers is the topic of today's interview. And actually, next week, we will discuss another of his uh, meta analyses that he's conducted. But today we get into the one titled Effect of High Intensity Interval Training versus Sprint Interval Training on Time Trial Performance, a Systematic Review and Meta Analysis. Of course, links will be in the show notes and episode descriptions as usual. Uh, so uh, you can go and check out the full, uh, full text article if you want to dig into the details. But in essence, what this means is what kinds of intervals are more effective or are, is there any evidence for, for different types of intervals being more effective than others? But before learning more about that and uh, getting into the interview, big thanks to our sponsors, Precision Hydration. Precision Hydration make electrolyte products that uh, you can match to your individual sweat sodium concentration, meaning that if you are somebody losing a lot of sodium in your sweat, then you can get a higher concentrated el electrolyte. And if you are somebody losing a lesser amount of sodium, then you can go for the moderate or low sodium concentration uh, supplement. And Precision Hydration has made it really easy to figure out where you might fall on that spectrum. They have a free online sweat test, which is simply a quiz consisting of 10 questions that you can answer uh, very easily without doing any specific measurements, just knowing yourself and how you react to training in terms of your sweat and salt stains and so on. And uh, that will give you a ballpark estimate for how much sodium you lose and help you decide on how much sodium you should replace in your goal races and training towards those races as well, of course. So check them out. And if you want to try any of their products, you can get 15% off your order with the promo code DETTRIATHLONSHOW15. And thank you to Roka that you can find on roka.com. Roka is not just any other triathlon gear and equipment manufacturer. They are extremely innovative as uh, evidenced by their multiple patents and groundbreaking technologies that they have in their products, including the patented arms up technology in their wetsuits and tri suits, which gives you maximal shoulder mobility in the swim segment of your triathlon. And as another example, on their sunglasses and prescription glasses side, they have, have technologies and features like the, the Geeko anti-slip technology that makes it impossible for your glasses to fall off your face, no matter how hard you shake. So uh, those are just some examples of how innovative Roka is. And this uh, innovation and the culture of innovation runs through the company and goes into making the products the best they can possibly be and helping you be the fastest athlete you can possibly be. You can get 20% off your order on roka.com forward slash TTS. Now, without any further ado, let's get into the interview with Michael Rosenblatt. Welcome to that triathlon show, Michael. How are you doing today? I'm doing. I'm doing very well. How are you doing? Doing good as well. Thank you, and uh, yeah, thank you for for agreeing to to come on the podcast. Uh, you have done two very interesting meta analyses uh, recently. As part of your your PhD research, uh, I assume we, will both of these meta analyses go towards that PhD that you're currently working on? Actually, uh, the the first one that I did um, uh, is actually what got me to decide to go into the PhD. So I, I started getting into some research and did a meta analysis, and I was like, "Wow, well, I should move forwards into a PhD." So the second one uh, actually is is a component of it. All right, and and that is the interval training one that uh, we'll talk about in. This first part of the interview, uh, I might actually split this interview into two episodes, but the intro training is the topic that you're doing your PhD on. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Okay, great. So let's start with that one. So the work that you did was to compare high-intensity intro training 
versus uh, sprint interval training. And you also did some subgroup analysis with the high intensity interval training that we'll get into. Uh, so can you first define those different types of intervals and uh, then tell us a little bit more about the, the background and the objective behind this meta-analysis? Sure. I actually, I think that's a great way to start because uh, there, there's always a little bit of confusion based on uh, interval training and and sometimes people call certain things hit when it might not actually be hit. Uh, and so uh, there, there's different types. There's a hit or high intensity interval training uh, and sprint interval training. So high intensity interval training would be uh, longer duration type intervals and they would uh, take place in uh, the severe intensity domain. So uh, basically, uh, uh, at an, in a domain that you can only maintain for a certain uh, duration for anywhere from a few minutes, uh, maybe up to about 10 to 20 minutes, uh, or actually around 20 minutes. But uh, sprint interval training would be these like all out efforts that would be in the extreme domain uh, and uh, typically are around 30 second all out efforts. Yeah, perfect. And uh, I'll have some links to, to related episodes on both of those that, that I've done in the past. Mm -hmm. So so then in the meta-analysis, basically you wanted to pool the research that has been done that has compared these two different types of intervals and uh, basically try to, to get a better understanding when you pool the data if one is more effective than the other. Is that correct? Yeah, and uh, specifically because previous meta-analyses uh, and, and other types of reviews, uh, they, they wouldn't normally differentiate between hit and sit. And because they would both occur in different uh, intensity domains, uh, I thought it'd be beneficial to look at uh, the differences between the two on, on different outcome measures uh, for performance or endurance sport performance. Yeah, and what outcome measures did you look at? So the primary outcome measure was time trial performance. Uh, I, I, I'm also a coach and an exercise physiologist, and I, I uh, always think about, you know, what do coaches really care about? And so I thought time trial would be the primary outcome because it's probably, it has the most external validity, and so it's most applicable. Uh, and then I also wanted to look at some uh, other measures like VO2 max and uh, MAP or max aerobic power or, or max aerobic velocity for those who be uh, those studies that included running. Yeah, and did you have any? Uh, may, maybe you uh, you shouldn't have any guesses, perhaps as a as an objective scientist before starting this. But well, I mean, we all we all do it to some extent, I guess. Did you have any guesses what you might find when you started the review? Yeah, actually, it's, it's interesting because I. I, I thought that there, that, that I, I saw there's a, a previous study that kind of got me thinking, well, there's something interesting going on here between hit and sit. I started thinking that there might be, that hit might be the way to go. And I thought it might be better than sit. And uh, the reason why I thought this and what, what kind of got me into looking at the difference between hit and sit uh, was uh, a 2016 study by a colleague of mine. His name's uh, Cesare Granada. Uh, he's uh, down in Australia. And he had published a, a, a study that compared hit versus sit, uh, and they looked at time trial performance. But he also included other measures, uh, including VO2 max, uh, as well as uh, looking at measures of mitochondrial biogenesis. So specifically looking at the respiratory function of the mitochondria. And the results were very interesting. It showed that uh, the sit group showed uh, a greater improvement in VO2 max and in mitochondrial biogenesis, or let's say uh, respiration, uh, compared to HIT, but only the HIT group showed an improvement in time trial performance. And so that made me think, well, you know, something's going on here. Maybe we're, we're only looking at certain outcome measures. And so maybe, you know, SIT would show benefits in some things and HIT would show benefits in others. And I wanted to differentiate between the two. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's really interesting to hear, and and I think we can get into that a bit more when we talk about the uh, the practical applications for for athletes and coaches. Yeah, but uh, uh, yeah, so so let's get into what you found in the meta analysis. So the first thing that uh, for those people that that are not aware, of course, that you do in a meta analysis is that you basically have certain criteria for the studies to be included, and you do an exhaustive search of the. A databases that are out there and you get a bunch of studies and you scan through the abstracts and the titles and and then you do a more detailed sort of deep dive and to see which ones are actually uh, eligible for inclusion in the meta-analysis so it's all 
predetermined. You have your protocol and you follow your your own protocol. And it's not just you, it's another scientist or two as well. So so then you end up with a certain number of studies and, and a certain number of total participants, which is always one of the important outcomes of a, or results of a meta-analysis. So how many studies did you find and what was sort of the how, how were they designed? Can you tell us more about the studies included in, yeah, as the final ones to be included in the in the analysis itself? Yeah, sure. So yeah, definitely, I had to uh, perform quite an exhaustive search, especially uh, using uh, interval training, because there's so much literature that's been done on interval training over the last 10, 15 years. Uh, once I got down to, you know, just the studies that uh, would meet the inclusion criteria, uh, there were six studies. Um and they included uh, participants. I, I only wanted to look at endurance athletes because I was looking at uh, time trial performance as my primary outcome. And I uh, included uh, athletes like rowers, cyclists, and runners, and, and uh, triathletes as well. Uh, interestingly, I, I wanted to include swimmers, uh, but it wasn't possible to be able to quantify the training intensity properly. Uh, so I had to exclude swimming from, uh, uh, from the meta-analysis. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I, there's about six studies. They were all randomized or pair matched, meaning that, uh, they had to include both a hit and a sit group and that individuals were either randomly assigned to those groups, uh, or they were, they were matched based on similar characteristics before they were separated to ensure that there'd be somewhat of a equal distribution of, uh, uh, participants in each group. Uh, and, uh, yeah, and then uh, the main outcome measure was time trial and any other sub uh, uh, performance measures or any other uh, outcomes were just kind of bonus. And, and I kind of looked into it, which is kind of where we got into VO2 max and, and MAP. Um, but yeah, it was uh, certainly a, a quite an exhaustive search. And, and uh, I think the studies ranged anywhere from three to 10 weeks in duration. Uh, so there were some that were a little bit shorter uh, and longer. And, and, uh, and another interesting thing that I found was uh, the duration of the time trials themselves. So there, there were some uh, studies that would have been included that were, you know, a 2K rowing time trial, which, you know, somewhere between seven, eight minutes, something like that, all the way up to 40 kilometer cycling time trial. So up to, let's say, an hour, hour five for more competitive athletes. Yeah. And, and about the subjects themselves, how, how many uh, total subjects did those uh, six studies have and what was the training status and uh, and the age and gender profile of them yeah so uh there there was about over 100 100 110 uh, participants uh that met the inclusion or that were included in all the studies some studies uh had as few as maybe you know three or four per group which made it difficult to do an analysis um uh, they ended up only being uh, males that were included, though that wasn't a, a limitation or, or, or one of the inclusion criteria for uh, uh, for this meta analysis. It just so happened that uh, uh, it was primarily, or a lot of the research is done in men, uh, and uh, their VO two max. So it's a nice way to look at their fitness level. We can we can uh, subjectively say their fitness level, and you know they'd say things like whether they're recreationally active or competitive. Uh, a nice way to objectively look at that would be by uh, looking at their VO2 max or their max amount of oxygen consumption. And the athletes range from 46 to 65 mils. So 46, we'd say, is somebody who's a healthy individual uh, in their 20s. Uh, and then up to 65 would, would certainly be a trained individual. Yeah. So what were the results that you found when you pulled these studies and uh, the effects of... Um, relative effects of, of uh, hit and sit versus each other? Yeah, so definitely there were some really interesting results, some that um, I somewhat was thinking would be the direction that the results would go, and then uh, some very surprising results. Uh, I'll start with a time trial. Uh, when I pulled the results, looking at uh, the difference between hit and sit just, uh, just as it is without doing a subgroup analysis, uh, it showed that uh, there wasn't a statistically significant difference between hit and sit. Uh, saying that, it showed that approximately there might have been a 1% greater improvement uh, following hit uh, as compared to sit. Uh, but uh, due to the variability, so if we say because of sample size and, and other things to consider, 
uh, there's a chance that that might not have been a, a significant difference. But uh, when we look at other measures, and actually the, the more surprising one was looking at VO2 max, and there was absolutely no difference between hit or sit uh, uh, in VO2 max measures. Uh, but when we look at MAP or max aerobic power, uh, there was actually almost a 2.5% greater improvement following hit. Uh, as compared to sit. And, and that's interesting because normally when we think about, you know, VO2 max versus MAP, I'm, I'm just saying MAP, but that would also include MAB or max aerobic velocity. Um, uh, so that would be actually the highest power output that you'd achieve uh, when you're doing an incremental test. So when you determine your VO2 max, your MAP would be, well, what's the power or the speed that you would achieve at, at VO2 max? So it was interesting that that the VO2 max itself showed no difference, but MAP uh, was, uh, yeah, it was surprising. So that would be potentially an indication of improved economy in in the group that had, in the hit group that had the improved MAP, MAV? That's exactly it. And uh, uh, VO2 max is just an indicator of max amount of oxygen that you can consume, whereas MAP or MAV um, it, it's it's an indicator of of the power that um, that somebody can achieve. So, for instance, you can have two athletes that have the same VO two max. So, let's say for argument's sake, uh, there's two athletes that have sixty mils, uh, and one athlete can have an MAP of let's say four hundred watts, whereas another one can have four hundred and fifty watts. And what that would mean is. You know, once we go above uh, an intensity of, let's say, critical power, you have a limited amount of time that you can maintain that power. And so this would show that maybe somebody's a little bit more efficient, uh, which would be, which would indicate or, or maybe be related to something like time trial performance. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the other thing that you also did is to then split the, the hit group into different durations or so you had short, medium and long intervals so can you tell a little, little bit more about that like how do you define those durations and uh, and why because that was quite interesting i found and also what the results were when you did that subgroup analysis yeah so this actually is where i i'd say the the cool part of this meta-analysis uh, uh comes out and you know at first i wasn't you know i was thinking well i should do a subgroup analysis because there is some variability in the the different hit groups so for instance if we just look at the sick groups, they were all 30-second all-out efforts with a certain amount of recovery. However, when we, we looked at the hit groups, uh, the duration of hit ranged anywhere from one minute up to about five minutes per uh, work bout. And so I was like, well, there isn't a significant difference in when we combine all of the, the, the studies, but what happens if we categorize them based on their... Uh, on their actual work bout duration. And so then, you know, I looked into the literature a little bit and found that, well, this has been done a little bit in the past. Uh, the issue is, is that there's no physiological reasons for the certain classification. So for instance, somebody might say short hit uh, or short duration hit might be, let's say only 30 seconds or less than a minute uh, and long would be greater than two minutes. And so what I did was I was trying to say, we should be justifying this based on, uh, the uh, the metabolism or the energy system that's predominant. So I classified short hit as less than two minutes in duration because uh, the the dominance energy system here would be anaerobic. So if it takes approximately two minutes to uh, reach a VO2 max, so we call that your oxygen uptake kinetics or your on kinetics, in order to, to get to that high level, uh, it takes approximately two minutes. Obviously, it depends on age and training status. Uh, then maybe anything less than that, the predominant energy system would be anaerobic. So we call that a uh, short hit. And then uh, I went in, in, and so I looked at short hit, medium hit, and long hit. But you can't really classify medium hit until you classify long hit. So then I thought, well, if you get to two minutes in duration, you're now exercising at uh, your peak oxygen or, or your peak oxygen uptake. Well, in order to call something an aerobic bout as opposed to an anaerobic work bout, you'd have to say, well, at least uh, half of the time that you're spent would be exercising with a predominance of aerobic metabolism. Um, 
So therefore, long hit would be uh, four minutes or greater in duration. So half of that bout is anaerobic predominantly. The other half of that bout would be aerobic predominantly. And then from four minutes up, uh, we would be uh, conducting uh, uh, an aerobic bout. So I call that long hit. And then in the middle there is where we would get medium hit. And so when we actually look at the results, uh, it was it, the classification system not only made sense physiologically, but it did differentiate between the results. And now we're starting to see significant differences in time trial performance between hit and sit based on, on work bout duration. And in fact, uh, the results for time trial for long hit uh, showed a, a 2% greater improvement following hit as compared to sit or for long hit. And that, that kind of said, well, this, this is substantial. We, we should be considering uh, uh, the, the characteristics of, of each of those uh, work bouts. Yeah, yeah, that's super interesting, and uh, and again, it might 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 just highlight what what we saw with the uh, with the general comparison of hit versus sit, but uh, but then perhaps more of the weight of that trend towards better performance in the hit group, and also the better, significantly better performance in terms of MAP or MAV, uh, that uh, the weight of that was carried by uh, by the long hit, and. Uh, and you, one might speculate then that that's the the reason that the long hit performed the best is that they uh, can best for uh, make the athlete translate the the oxygen uptake into actual mechanical power on the bike or on the run. Yes, is that a, f- a fair assessment? Yes, that's exactly kind of that's what I was thinking here, and and in fact we see those same results with MAP. Uh, where there is actually a 4% uh, greater improvement in MAP in those longer uh, hit bout durations. So then we'd say, well, you know, uh, there, there's different ways to, to look at, at, at hit. And we'd say, okay, well, oxygen consumption can be very, very high, even with shorter bouts of hit. Uh, so you could do, let's say, 15 seconds on, 15 seconds off. And, uh, and you can keep exercising like that still in the domain that would equate that to being hit. And what could be happening here is as soon as you go above critical power, you start draining your phosphocreatine stores. And unless you go below critical power, uh, that's, that's, that's actually what's happening is you constantly drain your, your phosphocreatine. And then when you do drop below some of that oxygen, in fact, there's a direct correlation. There's, there's literature that shows a relationship between the oxygen off kinetics and uh, replenishment of your phosphocreatine. And so it'd be interesting that if you're doing this kind of really, really short uh, interval training uh, bouts or work bouts that are, you know, let's say two minutes or one minute, uh, yes, oxygen kinetics could be high, but is it really going for locomotion versus the replenishment of phosphocreatine? Wait, can you clarify that? Because I, I didn't quite follow uh, in, in that example. Yeah, sure. So uh, for instance, uh, if... Uh, there's a lot of literature out there that, that's just looking at getting oxygen levels high. So for instance, uh, whether you're doing 15 seconds on or f- 15 seconds off or 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off, uh, we're not going to call this sit. It's still in the domain that we would call it hit. So the intensity is still in that uh, severe intensity domain. And uh, when we look at the total time that oxygen is elevated by doing these kind of shorter hit bouts, uh, it's elevated for quite a substantial amount of time. So for instance, if you're doing 30 on, 30 off for 10 minutes, we could say, well, yes, you're resting for, for 30 seconds at a time, but oxygen remains elevated. So the next question would be, well, why is oxygen still elevated during the recovery bout? And uh, there's literature that indicates that it has to do with replenishment of some of your energy systems. Mm, and yeah. so... It, it's important to not just consider just is the fact that oxygen levels are high. It's that our oxygen levels high during locomotion, which would then say that's why these longer bouts would be beneficial. So four minutes, we know that uh, you're above critical power, so you can't be replenishing your phosphocreatine stores. So the yeah. oxygen levels would be high for, let's say, for locomotion or the mechanical aspects of moving uh, as opposed to replenishing your, your energy systems. Yeah. So in other words, the high VO2 
could be the stimulus for improving VO2 max. And you can achieve that by doing those short on off intervals 15 on 15 off 30 on 30 off and so on because you get a lot of time where oxygen uptake is very high close to max and even with sprint interval training perhaps because you go so hard for 30 seconds then you have a prolonged period during the recovery that it actually remains elevated so you still accumulate a lot of time with with high oxygen uptake and that could be a great stimulus and that's why you mentioned that sprint interval training does seem to improve vo2 max very well but then when we compare that to the long intervals uh, you're not actually having that that high elevated VO2 while during locomotion, as you say, and that's the stimulus then for also improving your MAP or MAV. And uh, and at the end of the day, that those would also be highly correlated with uh, with time trial performance. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's exactly it. And 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 what's interesting is is when you do something like sprint interval training or uh, high intensity interval training with a lower uh, uh, duration uh, work bouts, we do see an increase in VO2 max, as you said, and we also see an improvement in mitochondrial biogenesis. And so we might speculate, I, I, I haven't seen the literature on this, that uh, it, it's possible that we're seeing this improvement in mitochondria uh, and VO2 uh, as a response to be able to replenish these PCR stores. So if we differentiate between, let's say, these fast twitch muscle fibers and slow twitch muscle fibers, we know that doing sprint interval training, it'll require fast twitch fibers. But we do see an increase in mitochondria in these fast uh, in these fast twitch fibers, and uh, we might say that 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 would be in order uh, uh, to produce ATP or energy uh, uh, to replenish our PCR stores. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense, and really interesting, really interesting. I mean, mm-hmm. this is spe- total speculation, but perhaps you could even think about periodization based on based on that that it might be. A slightly less overall taxing uh, way to increase VO2 max to work with shorter intervals and even a sprint interval training. And uh, if you're, when your goal is to raise VO2 max, but then when you have raised at VO2 max, let's say you do a, a block of that sort of training, then you bring in the longer intervals to actually raise your maximum aerobic power at that new higher VO2 max. And you don't have to work with those long intervals for as long a time as you might have because you can sort of shortcut it a little bit because i think most people would agree that it's a bit more pleasant to do sprint interval training as hard as they are compared to doing lung busting four minute intervals like think of your sort of 1200 meter repeats on the track and that sort of thing like that's that, that's that's hard so what do you think about that just speculation and thought about periodization so it's actually funny that you you brought that up and because uh, that's actually part of where some of my research is going to look at, you know, you know, if one shows it's better than another, if it, let's say, for instance, if hit is better than sit, maybe in certain circumstances, is there a benefit in, in using both, but for different reasons? And uh, yeah, so I, I'd certainly agree with you. Uh, something I, 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 I think is important to look into and uh, is certainly an area of research that, uh, or area that my research is going in. So uh, yeah, definitely uh, it, it's, it's, it's an interesting topic and there's a lot to look at in terms of, you know, what are we doing? And, and, and just to, to, to kind of clarify about the benefits of, of one versus another, if we're looking at something like time trial as our main outcome, well, we're not so worried about shifting uh, between doing little sprints during a race uh, or or cha- basically changing gears. But, you know, maybe doing something like sprint interval training can help in a real world experience in, in racing. So uh, I'd, I'd argue that maybe there's benefits to both. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, it, they have different specificity for different, different types of events. Yeah. So... Um, a couple of uh, other things. I do want to talk a little bit more about where your future research on this is going mm-hmm. and uh, another takeaway points. But but let's uh, discuss the limitations, potential limitations a little bit first. And one thing that, uh, that popped up and that you did uh, research or include in the analysis was the training load. And uh, when you compare the training load at intensity between the hit and the sit groups it's very evident that the hit group has a they do a just a higher workload at intensity and what do you think about that could that be the reason that for these potential differences even though there wasn't necessarily a significant difference when you just looked at the entire hit group but 
yeah, how do you view the training load difference? Yeah, so that's that's definitely important to talk about. Uh, so when we, when we look at uh, the exact session uh, or per session, uh, there was a significant difference between you know high intensity interval training and sprint interval training, which would make sense because uh, you know if you do let's say four by four minute intervals, there are sixteen minutes of work. Whereas if you do uh, four or six bouts of thirty second efforts, you're you're only getting two to three minutes of work. And uh, it's interesting to note that even though the results showed that there wasn't a statistically significant difference uh, in the total work uh, that was done between the groups, that has a little bit more to do with the variability. So because the the variability was so wide in in the studies, uh, it showed that there was no uh, significant difference. Though I'd argue that if maybe this uh, had more studies, uh, it might have kind of narrowed things down that it would show that there was a difference. Uh, yeah, uh, but uh, it, it's interesting to look at workload, and, and I was thinking, well, there, this could be a problem here as to why uh, there is a difference. Uh, uh, there was a study though that came out in, in 2017 by uh, I hope I pronounce his name correctly, Vollard and Group, uh, and what they did was they looked at uh, sprint interval training on VO2 max, and they looked at one of the outcomes that they found was looking at how many bouts per session. And the, they found that four bouts per session led to the greatest improvement in VO2 max. And that for every two additional bouts, there was a decrement in performance as measured by VO2 max. So it, it indicated that it's not necessarily about how much work you do. It's just the fact that you've stressed the system enough. And so that's the first thing that I considered when I looked at that. So it's okay that uh, in one sense that maybe the, the workload w- was different because in fact it would have nev- negative implications, at least from the literature, uh, that doing more sit, uh, it, it would be, it, it potentially would inhibit performance. And, and then the next thing that I, I like to consider, and I think this is very important that I think a lot of people forget to, to think about when you're looking at hit versus sit. And I like to, uh, my analogy that I've been using recently is, uh, for somebody who's taking, who has, let's say, high blood pressure, and they need to take medication for high blood pressure, and there's different ways to lower high blood pressure. You can either take a water pill, which kind of makes you uh, decrease your plasma volume or blood volume, and so there'd be less pressure on the arteries, or you can take something like a beta blocker, which decreases your heart contractility. But the goal is still to decrease blood pressure. So you can do hit versus sit let's say to increase performance or VO2 max. And, and we see in the results of this meta-analysis or, or my meta-analysis that there's no difference in VO2 max. But we'd say they're kind of like taking different drugs because they're, they're occurring in different uh, intensity domains. So HIT, as I mentioned earlier, takes place in the severe domain, whereas SIT would take place in the extreme domain. And because of that, uh, there'd be a different physiological response that's occurring there. Um, and so I think that it'd be hard to compare the workload, uh, if we think about things this way, uh, because they're, it's, it's kind of like taking two different drugs. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. That's, that's a great point. And when, when you compare workload, of course you, you compare the volume and the intensity Mm -hmm. and you assume that there's a linear dose response relationship with intensity, but as you say, they're in different domains and, uh, Perhaps that relationship isn't as, as linear as we would like to think, and mm-hmm. that's also one one thing that I talked about quite a lot on this podcast. With which is why training stress score that is used uh, quite a lot isn't isn't the be all end all when it comes to measuring training load because it it has this same potential flaw of uh, that uh, you're not really seeing where the breakpoints happen in in terms of the intensity domains and how 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 different the the diff- they they weigh when you um when when you cross from one domain to another potentially and it's not to say that the domains we have defined are perfect by any means but just at certain points you you just can't can't assume that there's a linear uh linear relationship anymore between uh, between the intensities of different types of intervals Mm -hmm. yeah definitely so uh, the other thing that I wanted to uh, ask as well is in these uh, studies that you included, did the participants do any other endurance sort of base training, easy training, or did they just do the intro sessions? What was sort of like their training week looking like? 
So there, there was a mix, and I think this is because uh, some uh, some of the studies just include recreational athletes that they just wanted to look at the the influence of, let's say, hit versus sit. Um, uh, and actually, there, some of the studies also included a control that might have included continuous training, and that was the control. Uh, whereas other studies would include the the interval training program with uh, continuous training as well, and. Uh, you know, it, it has the potential to influence the results, and this would this would only be the case if we were just looking at a pre post design. But uh, because they were randomized, and there was a hit and a sit group uh, in both uh, uh, within the same study, uh, I wouldn't think too much that um, whether or not there were like some studies would include continuous training and some studies wouldn't. So uh, definitely another thing that I thought about when when looking at this. Um, but uh, luckily, in this case, it would almost kind of cancel itself out. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So maybe let's give, can you first, well, first, um, give a short summary or the findings again for the listeners to make sure that we have everybody with us before we discuss the take-home messages. Mm -hmm. So when we look at uh, uh, doing high-intensity interval training, um, it's, uh, there, there may not be a, a difference between hit and uh, sit, but when, when, at least in terms of time trial performance, when we look at a subgroup analysis uh, of hit versus sit, there's longer, uh, longer duration intervals, four minutes or greater, will lead to approximately a 2% uh, greater improvement in, in performance as compared to sprint interval training. And we see that um, across the board with other outcome measures. Well, actually, the only one other outcome measure that I looked at here, which would be MAP or max aerobic power. And we see that it's, it's almost like a similar uh, type of improvement between uh, or similar results between short, medium and long hit intervals. Uh, however, the interesting thing was we didn't see that that same improvement in in VO2 max uh, or the actual amount of oxygen consumption. Uh, so I'd say when we're, when we're looking at that, it, it's there's it's more about looking at submaximal efficiency as opposed to uh, maximal performance as measured by VO2 max. Mm, yeah, perfect summary. And I think we, maybe we didn't even mention this, but well, like the how you define hit versus sit. I mean, you talked about that and the types of sessions done, but in terms of intensity, you, I think, defined hit as between critical power and uh, and VO2 max, mm -hmm. and uh, then sit was anything above VO2 max. Yes, and so if we think, you know, critical power, uh, you know, there, there might be some research that might, some research, researchers, sorry, researchers that disagree with me and, and others that might agree because there's conflicting literature. Uh, but we'd say that that domain, uh, the, the lower border of the domain would either be critical power or your second ventilatory threshold or your respiratory compensation point. So basically, there's this kind of, you know, this border there. Uh, and that the high end of that domain would be uh, where your VO2 max is. Uh, and that would be your severe intensity domain where hit would take place. And then anything above that would be your super maximal efforts in the extreme domain. Uh, and that's where sit would uh, take place. And one thing to note about, and uh, there's only, and I'm, I'm starting to write about this a little bit as well, but one thing to note uh, is that the upper limit of the domain uh, you can reach a VO2 max at any point within the severe domain, depending on how long you're exercising for. So uh, probably the most appropriate way to define the upper limit of the severe domain would be the highest power output or speed uh, that can still achieve a VO2 max. Uh, whereas any power above uh, any power above that intensity, you'll fatigue before you're actually able to see a VO2 max. Mm, yeah. Yeah, that's that's super interesting. And and since you said that for for many for the average athlete it might take uh, around 2 minutes, maybe a bit less uh, to reach VO2 max, that basically means that the sprint interval training is at an intensity that you can you can hold for less than 2 minutes r r roughly speaking. Yes, that, that's actually correct. So even though you know we typically do these thirty-second all-out efforts, a sprint interval training uh, bout could be anywhere from thirty seconds up to 
you know, if we were to argue that two minutes would be the border less, you know, up to about two minutes. Yeah. But you would obviously have difficulties doing anything more after doing one absolute all out. Yeah. You'd have, effort. <laughs> wouldn't want to do more than that. <laughs> no. So, so let's get into some practical uh, applications of, of this then. So you're also coaching and uh, how, how do you use this information in, in, in coaching and in training? So that, that's a great question because this is really what it comes down to. And, and you know, I, I hope I'd consider myself more of an applied uh, physiologist or applied sports scientist uh, here. And what I probably do is by looking at the results, there's, there's actually two things that I, I think about. Uh, one, if we just look at you know, the interval sessions themselves, I'd say based on these results, I'd consider saying, well, athletes should be doing uh, uh, four by four minute intervals with, you know, approximately four minutes of rest between each bout. I mean, you can do a little bit of less rest, but the, the idea is that you fully recovered it between each bout. But uh, I'd say at least four minutes. Um, sometimes I'd have athletes, once they get, once they're a little bit fitter, maybe getting up to about six minutes. Uh, but uh, those longer duration uh, bouts um, uh, would probably be the way to go. Uh, and... Uh, the other thing that I that I think is important to note that most people haven't considered, and this was kind of something that came up and it was surprising, was using MAP as a good measure of performance. And this is this is going to be a very interesting result to talk about because MAP is the highest power that you'll achieve doing an incremental test. And obviously it would change based on the duration of the incremental test. Uh, based on what I'm seeing right now, I'd say it's probably best to do these kind of 30, 15 or 30 second increments of about 15 to 30 watts to do this. But the nice thing is, is that it's a good measure of performance. We can measure change in performance. You don't need any fancy equipment and you can do a test in, you know, 15 minutes as opposed to doing a 40K time trial to look for performance. So not only is it a good measure that we can see change, but the one thing that was very interesting when we looked at the results of the MAP was that the standard deviation was substantially narrow. So it had a, a, a much lower variability doing MAP tests as opposed to looking at time trial, which might improve its validity. So uh, it, it's, it's a different type of take-home message, I think, for, for coaches, but it, it could be a, a nice way to assess for where someone's performance is. It'll, it'll assess their uh, efficiency you can do it short and quick and you don't have to worry about too much fatigue for your athletes uh, and it will measure change. Yeah, perfect. The, I really like those two points and uh, yeah, really, really interesting stuff. So let's talk about where you're taking your research now in, in this area. What, what's, what's next? What are you working on right now? So uh, yeah, I can, I can certainly talk a little bit about it because it's um, pretty much on the go with this right now. And uh, as I'm sure you can imagine, because of COVID, it's been affected substantially. Um, but uh, I'm still finding ways to be a little creative here. So one thing that I'm that I am working on that I can discuss a, a little bit is I'm I've collected uh, all the studies uh, probably in existence that I can find that are published uh, on any form of interval training and time trial performance. So any study that would either be a randomized trial or a pre post study. And I'm working on uh, a meta regression right now that'll look at all the baseline characteristics of an individual, including, let's say, their, their age, uh, their sex, their baseline VO2, their training status, as well as all the program characteristics uh, to, to develop a model uh, uh, to help with programming, uh, indiv with individualized programming for interval training. So that's one thing that I'm working on right now. Uh, and, uh, uh, it's coming along and it, I've, I've looked at some of the preliminary results and it's, it's kind of, it's quite interesting. Uh, and, uh, and then also I still hope to do, uh, some primary data collection and I'm finding a way to be a little creative with this right now. So I'm going to be uh, putting ethics through for another study. Uh, and what we're going to be doing is testing the effects of different types of interval training on MAP and time trial. And uh, I'm going to try to do this kind of this mass recruitment where people can train from home. And as long as they have the right equipment, uh, we can try to collect as much data as we can uh, 
uh, to kind of see uh, which type of interval training might have better effects and maybe how long should somebody be doing these these for. Yeah, well, when you are recruiting, if uh, if you want that, you can share the information with me, and I'll be sure to to announce that on the on the podcast because I think that that would be really uh, really interesting to to help you get subjects. And definitely that uh, meta regression that you're working on sounds uh, absolutely uh, fascinating. So so once you have the official results of that, then uh, we we should have another discussion and, and talk about that. But uh, for now, um, because I am going to, we're going to keep talking about polarized versus threshold training, and that will be next week's interview for the listeners. But uh, uh, since this is your first appearance on the show, you will get to answer the rapid fire questions. But also, uh, first, uh, can people follow you and your work somewhere? What is, uh, is there any place that uh, where you post about it and so on? So uh, yeah, I, uh, I actually have very limited social media. Um, so busy these days, but uh, there's two there's two places I guess you can find me online, and one is I, I I'm starting to update more uh, my research gate uh, profile, and so there's some information on there, and I'm, I'm slowly starting to update that. Uh, and then I also have my own website, um, and it's called evidence uh, www.evidencebasedcoaching.ca. Uh, and, uh, that's something that I've been thinking about doing is kind of putting some more of my own research on there and some, uh, some preliminary findings of, of some of my, uh, some of my work. So yeah, those would probably be the two best places to, to follow me. Great. And, uh, now for the rapid fire questions first, what's your favorite book, blog, or resource? Okay. So that's a good one. Um, uh, it's it, you might laugh at this, but because I've been so busy lately, I haven't been able to uh, read as much as I'd like in terms of fiction. But uh, I have to say, PubMed is 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 where I live these days, and uh, yeah, PubMed's uh, my my favorite resource right now. Yeah, well, you you have access to the full articles through there, so I completely understand it. For <laughs> me, ResearchGate is is one of those because there I can get the full article quite often, and uh, if not, I can request it, and more often than not, somebody will send it to me. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's the non-university uh, way of replacing PubMed. Yeah. Uh, then, what's your favorite piece of gear or equipment? So, uh, my favorite my favorite equipment, I'd have to say, is my Cervelo S two. Uh, I bought it when I was in physio school because I got a great deal on it and uh, uh, I got free upgrades to full Dura Ace on it. And uh, yeah, my favorite, I, it's like my dream bike. So yeah, love it. And finally, what's a personal habit that's helped you achieve success? Uh, I'd have to say I read a lot. And my, my wife, uh, <laughs> I was recently married. Uh, I got married in June. So uh, and, uh, she said, I've never met anyone who reads as much as you. And it's for me, I say, it's like playing, you know, some people like to play video games. Reading for me is like playing video games, reading all the latest science. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Michael, for coming on the show. We'll continue the discussion, uh, right after this with, uh, the discussion on polarized training, but for the listeners, it will be another, other week. So, so thank you for now. Yeah, you're very, very welcome. Thank you for having me. I hope that you enjoyed that episode. And uh, if you did, then uh, there will be another one next week. So uh, that's uh, great news. That one will be on uh, polarized training versus threshold training, which is Michael's uh, other meta-analysis. And uh, the full text or the full title of that uh, of that article is Polarized versus Threshold Training Intensity Distribution on Endurance Sports Performance, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis of Randomized Control Trials. So definitely worth checking that one out if you're interested in train the topic of training intensity distribution, which you should be because it's an important topic. You can find the show notes for this episode on scientifictriathlon.com with links to plenty of uh, resources, including, of course, the specific meta-analysis discussed today, but also a number of interviews I've done in the past on the podcast with, for example, Professor Paul Larson on high-intensity interval training and uh, Dr. Jerome Corral on sprint interval training and some other relevant uh, interviews and episodes as well. If you are looking for training plans or coaching services, then uh, do go and check out scientifictriathlon.com. 
we have all the information about the products and services we offer on the website and you can send us an email if you want to learn more finally big thanks to our sponsors precision hydration that you can find on precisionhydration.com go and take their free online sweat test and get 15 percent off your order with the promo code that triathlon show one five and thank you to roca that you can find on roca.com Check out their wetsuits, dry suits, swimskins, goggles, and high performance eyewear, and prescription glasses and sunglasses, and get 20% off your order with a discount code that you'll find on roca.com forward slash TTS. Thank you, as always, for listening. Keep training smart and keep loving craft love.